Hello, everyone. Um, today, I'm giving a talk about contributing to amp.dev. Um, we're going to go over the what, when, and how. My name is Crystal Lambert. I am the technical writer on AMP. Um, I have been with the team for about a year and a half now, and it's been quite the AMP venture. Nana, you do not have a claim on all the bad puns. <laughs> so we have a ton of uh, a ton of content on amp.dev, but today I want to focus specifically um, on what falls into these five buckets, the developer-focused contents. But extra specifically, these three, guides and tutorials, components, and examples. And uh, if you are contributing to the AMP code base, you are probably most familiar with the reference docs. And um, that's because if you're a core committer on the AMP engineering team, you are responsible for writing that reference documentation. And I know you probably hate it and me for that. So let me start off by saying thank you. Thank you so much for helping me in this way. And let's get the awkward part of this presentation out of the way. I've heard a couple times, um, don't we have a technical writer? Yes, it's me. I introduced myself a couple slides ago. Um, and you know, shouldn't they be writing all of the things? So I just want to talk, take a step back and talk a little bit about what job responsibilities fall under a technical writer, since um, it varies greatly from team to team. And I've been telling my parents for the entire two years I've been a technical writer, every time I see them, exactly what my job is, because nobody really understands. <laughs> So um, I do a lot of things. I uh, help with the information architecture of our website. I create demos. I do documentation long-term planning. I've been doing a lot of that with the stories team lately. Um, I write guides. I create tutorials. I do content reviews when other people send up documentation. Um, I do a lot of community management, especially with contributions. Um, I help manage some of the translation initiatives. I do oh, a contribution engagement with community engagement, management, all the things. And um, a lot of extracurriculars. I'm giving a presentation next week about technical writing. And so all that falls under sort of technical writing. So I want to walk through a process of just one of those responsibilities. And that would be like writing a guide. So step one in an ideal world is research, figure out what the documentation type is going to be. Is it going to be a guide? Is it going to be a tutorial? Does it need to become a spec? Um, scoping out exactly how large it's going to be, finding code samples. During that process, I take a ton of notes. I write down all the observations I come across and just write down things that I notice that might be good for other people to know. I then go interview all of the subject matter experts that is all of you who are committing code. Thank you. Um, and I send a lot of emails with questions as well. And then, you know, I draft it, I write it, I review it. And uh, that's it, right? Ha, no. So <laughs> this is a cycle that bounces back and forth constantly, depending on exactly what issues I run into, what pitfalls I fall into. And it can go on and on and on forever. Um, and depending on the scope and the complexity of the document I'm trying to create, this could take anywhere from a few days to a couple of weeks. But then, once everything's finally said and done, I get to post it. Post it. Because uh, I am not perfect, and neither are any of you. <laughs> Mistakes happen. So, a style guide and tutorial, again, could take um, any number of days and weeks to complete. And that alone can be a full-time job. As remember again from a couple slides ago, there's tons and tons of things that are coming down the pipeline that seem to be related to documentation. And this is why I really depend on documentation contributions, especially when it comes to the reference docs. Um, and you, as the ones contributing to, um, the actual code to the AMP HTML repository, um, you're making those changes. You're the ones who are adding new features and deprecating functionality. You know, it's really, really helpful when you update the documentation along the way. I feel like sometimes I'm always playing catch up because I just can't possibly be in the know about everything that's changing with AMP all of the time and letting all the people who need to know know. So, 
when you commit a change to AMP, I need you to just ask this one question. What about my change will affect developers building with AMP? Just, just write it down. Just write down what you think will affect them. It doesn't have to be pretty. It doesn't even have to be grammatically correct. Um, I call this word vomit. And word vomit is exactly how every single one of my documents start. They're an absolute mess. And then I have to sort through it and figure out how to make it cohesive. But speaking of actually writing things down, I want to go through a real quick scenario. I get assigned to a lot of issues that are filed like this. And that is usually followed by me trying to track down existing documentation on whatever this fancy attribute is, <laughs> spending hours fiddling with said attribute, digging through code, trying to find out what that means, sending tons of back and forth emails, and ultimately ending up spending multiple hour syncs with people, and it ends up just being a big waste of time and a runaround. Nobody wants this, you don't want this, I don't want this, the AMP developers don't want this. So a good thing to consider when filing issues or when changes are made is um, to be a little bit more verbose. So when I get issues like this, AMP developers are confused about how to use the fancy attribute. It should be added to components that are underdressed. Adding this attribute will make all text content cursive, surround the element with a lace border. It's only valid on UI components, such as AMP carousel or AMP form, it's supported on websites and stories, but not emails and ads, and it may, help add, it may help to add it to the common attributes guide. This gives me so much information to at least get started about what to do with this new um, addition to the AMP ecosystem. So before you file an issue or add me to it, I'm going to have to ask you to ask yourself just two more questions. Um, could you, do you know the answer to it? And could you write out a draft? If you understand the issue and what needs to be changed, you definitely understand it better than I do. Um, and I kind of like to phrase it like this. If you, have you ever lost your sunglasses on top of your own head? Yeah, I do it all the time. When you're writing an issue or looking at an issue, pretend like I don't know what sunglasses are. <laughs> Um, and it's important to remember when we're making these changes that the reference documentation is our absolute source of truth. Um, AMP developers rely on it. I rely on it. We really, really need it to be accurate and current. Please, again, add me on any relevant updates. And of course, let me know if you need help with the documentation in any way, shape, or form. Some of you may remember this slide from last year. Talking about if you build these incredible components and features, that people will just come and use them. And uh, I can tell you, this is still false. <laughs> people won't use things if they don't understand how to use them. Um, frustration, I feel, is one of the biggest blockers when people are trying new things. Nobody likes to feel stupid, and we like to help them along the way. So one thing I hear a lot from people is, um, they're not good at writing. And I'm going to let you in on a very, 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 very big secret right now. I am not a good writer either. <laughs> I just happen to be less bad at it than a lot of other people. Writing is difficult. And I always need help from a reviewer. I always send up a typo. Nothing on amp.dev is perfect. But anything and everything you write, is going to be useful and helpful for me and probably a lot of other people in any way. So please stop being embarrassed about it. And I know writing is a lot of work. And I'm going to give you some tools that's going to make it a little bit easier. I have a Go link right here, um, go.amp.dev-ref-template, which is a blank reference doc which is a template to help with reference documentation, specifically for AMP. You can use this when you're creating a new component, or if you would like help uh, cleaning up existing documentation. It's not you know, the clear-cut way for every single AMP component or every single AMP reference documentation, but it's a really great jumping-off point. 
And again, if you have any questions or any comments about it, you can definitely reach out to me. So I just spent the entire first portion of this presentation talking about writing things. And uh, I'm going to be real right now. A lot of do developers just skim the documentation for code samples. In some of these documents, words could basically not exist. So let's make these great code samples so that people know how to use them. Um, so I encourage everybody to keep that kind of behavior in mind when you're creating documents. Um, and I just have a few outlines on what makes a good code sample. They should be copy and pasteable. Um, it explains one specific thing. They have self-explaining variable names. And they are, on amp.dev, executable. What does executable mean? We have a brand new fancy feature on amp.dev where your code samples can be interacted with readers right on the document. Uh, before we moved over, it was just static code that people then had to move over into the playground. But we now have this super cool option. And then, um, as it showed earlier in the GIF, there was a link where it takes you directly to the playground. Yeah, open the snippet in the playground. And this is super awesome that we can show people exactly what attributes do right there inside the document. And so this must be difficult to do, right? So this is the code snippet from that accordion sample. And to make it executable inline on amp.dev, we only add this. Ooh, ah. Thank you, thank you. That all credit goes to Sebastian for that, but I appreciate it. Um, and this is what it does. It's just these simple short code, and then the back end of amp.dev turns it into this awesome inline executable code sample. But wait, there's a little bit more. We can, there's different types of previews that you can do depending on the code sample you're trying to create. Um, this one I have up here is called a top frame. And uh, I've used it for the animation guide, um, so, which is really good for visuals. I love it because you can switch between landscape and portrait mode um, to see how it would look mobile versus desktop. It's pretty cool. So what does this one look like under the hood? That's it. We've just changed the preview to top frame. And one thing I'd like to highlight here, or a big difference between it, let me go back. This one has the imports where we import amp accordion. And that one's just displaying like a very, very simple um, component. This one, I have the actual script tag inline because when it's a big, uh, when it's a bigger, more intricate one like that, people like to copy and paste it there, and they might get a little frustrated if they don't realize the script isn't being inline. Just a side note on that. So, for other types of code samples um, that are require like a backend or something to import, we have existing ones for you to use. So you don't even have to create data for that um, if you would like to throw up a code sample. Um, although if we do not have one that exists for you, you are encouraged and free to contribute to us in that way. And oh, again, that's it, mostly. Um, there's a little few nuances about how to do those inline code snap, um, snippets. And information on that is at the short link, go.amp.dev slash contribute slash code dash samples. Really really short go link. <laughs> um, so while you're heading to our contributor guidelines, uh, I'd like to finish up by talking about uh, other types of content and that contribution process. So there are, uh, we accept several types of content contributions. Um, in the amp.dev repository, we have GFIs, or good first issues. Um, simply assign it to yourself and tackle it. And there's a Go link for that as well. Um, you can edit existing documentation if you catch something that needs to be updated. You can just go in and fix it really quick. Uh, we also have the AMP translation initiative. If you happen to be bilingual, we accept um, translations of our documentation. And this is useful both for new documentation and sometimes um, you know, things happen really quickly and we update the English one and the other ones fall behind. So if you happen to notice that, we would really appreciate your help in that way. And there's a, guess what, a Go link for that. And you can create 
entire new content to be posted on amp.dev. So creating new content, there, that one's kind of a bigger process than the other ones. Um, there are three main types of new contents. I said three, but I'm going to list four. <laughs> Guides, tutorials, examples, and reference. Reference, you should only be adding new document, new content, like completely new um, files of that if you're adding an entire new AMP component. And uh, so how do you know when it is a good time to add new content? The obvious answer is new components and features, but there's a lot more to it. And I'd like to raise your hand if you've caught yourself thinking any of these things. This is the fifth time I've answered this question for a developer. Everyone seems really confused. I'll make a really quick code pen to send out. Yeah. No one seems to understand why we've built this component. <laughs> yeah, thank you. And um, I've added functionality that solves this reoccurring issue. Why aren't developers implementing it? This is the sign you've been looking for. We need some new content on amp.dev. So if you see yourself asking these questions and you realize that we could use some more content, but you don't know how to start writing it or you're not really sure what to do, this is again something you can contact me about. But we do have an issue in um, the amp.dev GitHub repository that allows you to file a content proposal. Um, and then there's another template, this link here, I don't have a Go link for it, you're gonna have to go, um, that has a, uh, another template that will help you get started filling out this content proposal. Um, it's essentially an outline. Um, so if you're hearing yourself saying any of those things I listed on the previous slide or anything kind of close to that, um, that should be an indicator to start a conversation about uh, what types of content we can be contributing. Um, I'm happy to figure out where in our documentation is going wrong or what the solution is. And filling out the content proposal doesn't necessarily mean you must write it. Um, it does give me an idea of what priorities that we should have um, with the pipeline of documentation. And having um, a collection of documents that we're looking for, or we think we should have, really encourages documentation contributors. Because um, a lot of people want to write, they just don't quite know exactly what it needs when they're coming into a new open source project. So if you happen to be somebody here who wants to contribute content for amp.dev, first off, thank you. And second, we do have a project called Content in the Repository, where I have a list of um, good first issues for things that need to be fixed and some higher level, more complex documentation needs um, that you can help with. And if you want to propose something, uh, please do that as well. Ah, and that time, it is it for real. Uh, so you can reach out to me uh, on Twitter, Instagram, and then there's my amp.dev email. So, and I'm here like all day and tomorrow. So let me know. Thank you. Mm -hmm.